All right, praise God. I believe it's time to begin our Wednesday Bible study. Uh, hopefully, I'll have a few more folks showing up. But uh, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, he said, I will be there in the midst of them. And so we have more than that here. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'd like to ask Reverend Lopez to pray. Father, once again, thank you for the opportunity to come in your presence, to hear your word. God, speak to our hearts, accomplish your will. Thank you for all that you're going to do. Make teaching easy for pastor tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty. And again, we should have some more uh, participants showing up a little bit later. That's just part of church work. If you're going to do anything involving church, anything at all, the folks going to be late. Yeah. Yeah. So, we're, so hey, brother, welcome. So right now we're in the book of Psalms, or as uh, one person called it before, the book of Splasms. It's just too funny, Splasms. <laughs> anyway, Psalm 1, and I'd like to read uh, Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, <clears throat> nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And just so much in the Bible, just so much in those scriptures, uh, but tonight what we're really focusing in on is uh, to be careful who you listen to. Right? Be careful who you listen to. Uh, hearing and listening are not necessarily the same thing. They're related. But you can hear everything going on in a crowded room. But that doesn't mean you hear the distinct voices or conversation or the, uh, it's just sound, it's not, it doesn't take on any real meaning unless you listen. Uh, just like a, a radio station, right? If you're, if you're on a unused uh, band frequency and it just sounds like static. And if you just uh, tune it in just a little bit, you may get an actual signal that has actual uh, people talking or music playing, etc. But here in the, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 1, he said, Blessed is the man that walketh not, and walketh is walks, right? That walks and not in the counsel of the ungodly. Now that's that's not walks like, like uh, the cookbook is called 51 Days to Walk the Dog. W okay? I'm just kidding. It's just silly. It's just silly. Right? But to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. And there's, you know, I mean, you, you could you could spend a lifetime just pondering that part of the verse. So who do we who do we go to for counsel when you're not sure about a decision? When you're looking for validation that you're making the right choices in your life, when you're pondering some type of investment, uh, where to move finances, or should you liquidate, should you buy, should you sell, should you hold, uh, who we listen to, right? Who do we go to for that counsel? And he says here very clearly that we're blessed. Right? And I would say we're only blessed if we don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. The ungodly is anyone who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Anyone that has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, well, they might be good folks in some ways. They might know how to cook really well. They might be a snazzy dresser, right? Uh, but if they don't know Jesus, then they don't really know how to give you the right advice, the right counsel. Because the sinner 
the ungodly will not factor in your commitment as a Christian, your obligation to the Lord that has, has you bound spiritually to God through the new birth. They can't understand the things of God, the spiritual things of God. So whatever they say to you about what you should do, um, it's a good idea not to listen to it. Right? They might share things uh, out of a sincere concern. They might have uh, worldly wisdom uh, that has worked for them to help them to be successful in some aspect of their life. But they, they don't have the right words to share with you as a child of God. Right? In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So subtle is very furtive, right? very secretive, very discreet. Uh, just, you know, it's, it's like um, people that just kind of hang around, you know, maybe at the Chuck E. Cheese or something. There's, uh, uh, you know, uh, signs, at, signs at the playground or whatever, and it says, uh, any adult must be accompanied by a child, right? Any adults present must be accompanied by a child. So they don't want people without kids hanging around other people's kids, but that subtlety, you know, just just kind of hanging hanging around, just always being there. Uh, it's uh, like a friend of mine. He he caught this goose, and he was doing doing some work. It's kind of a strange story. He was doing some work for this family, and they were kind of well to do up in Washington. And he just worked for them, did whatever. You know, he's good good uh, good with his hands, handyman. You know, he could do farming and, and uh, you know, pick weeds and uh, take care of livestock, all that kind of stuff. And uh, he asked he asked them if he could have this goose. They had a goose among all of their possessions. And they said, sure, if you could catch them, you can have them. And he said, okay. He said, I'd like you to have this pot full of water, and I want you to have it boiling hot at 12 p.m. 12 p.m. have that water boiling and uh and so you know he 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 started making his approach to this goose around like 11 30 or so and and the goose was there and he's, he's standing there with his eyes closed and my friend would take one step closer to that goose and the goose would detect the sound or feel the the, the breeze shift slightly and he'd open an eye, and he'd see my friend over there, and then he didn't—he didn't look much different than he did the last time. So he closed his eye. My friend took another step. Well, to make a long story short, uh, at eleven fifty-nine, he was standing right next to that goose, and he grabbed a hold of his neck, and he, uh, you know, he did did whatever he had to do to get that goose ready to put into that boiling water. And that's exactly what happened at 1201. That goose was down in that hot water, right? Dead and having its, uh, its feathers starting to, uh, to get removed, you see? And that's how you gotta watch for people that are subtle. Uh, sometimes people say things without really saying things. You know what I mean? There's a, it's like every five minutes. I don't, want to, I don't want to share too much details, but I, I know this person. I knew this person. And they don't, they're not in Fresno, don't worry. But they, they had just, I mean, just the, the sharpest tongue to say things in like a very discreet manner, in a very non-direct manner. Uh, for example, um, you know, say, say, it was, say it was you and another person. And maybe you both made something to bring for like a potluck or whatever. And, and, uh, and maybe you made something pretty close to the same thing, like fried chicken or whatever. 
And then this person would say, well, that, that other person really knows how to make fried chicken, you know, like that. And, and so that, that it was, it's, it's really uh, kind of a rub against you. And that's just one of the, and there was many things this person would say uh, when she didn't like someone. She, she had, she had her, she had, this person had her way about saying things without really saying it directly. And, and it was, uh, it was kind of even more offensive than just being called out and being insulted to your face because, uh, to be indirect about it, it's, uh, it's also an, it's also means to imply that you're too dumb to understand that you're getting insulted right now, or you're too dumb to be able to make some type of other statement to, uh, in, in your own defense or whatever. So you got to watch out for those subtle people because that's like the devil. You can uh, mute it, sir. Great. Those, mutal, those, uh, those subtle people, similar to the serpent in the garden. So perhaps he's been, are muted. Perhaps he's been hanging themselves. around. Perhaps he, you know, he just been there so much, he, they, he just kind of fit in like a piece of the furniture. And then he spoke, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Hath not God said so? The, uh, the important thing to remember is if you're having a conversation with the devil, chances are you're going to come out on the losing end of that conversation. And the devil is very wise. He's very old. He's very wise. And Jesus even tells us in the book of Matthew to what to be harmless as doves and wise as serpents, right? So the serpent is considered to be very wise. So when people are uh, entertaining the devil, and there's a, an old expression we say in church about having Pepsi with the devil. They say so-and-so was drinking Pepsi with the devil. And it's, it's like there's a cloud over your head. There's like this, the, these bad feelings just start coming out. You start thinking about different people and it starts to make you upset when you think about them. And, and you start imagining uh, that your last conversation was an argument when it wasn't really an argument. And you start thinking, and it starts to get you all worked up. And, and, and your blood pressure gets higher. And, you, and, and now, now you're looking to have an argument with this person that they don't even know what's going on. Well, that's the devil. That's having Pepsi with the devil. When you can feel yourself have like this dirty feeling, just, you know, it, you just, it just feels dirty. It just feels wrong. And, and you know, you have, you're having these, uh, another expression is called stinking thinking, right? You're having these, this, these stinking thoughts and, and these ideas are coming to your mind. They're not from you. They're from the devil. And so what are we supposed to do? He said, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And friends, we have to do that. We have to control our thoughts. We have to bring our thoughts into captivity. When the devil is trying to get you, to feel animosity towards your brother, or towards your sister, we have to say, time out. No, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to listen to these accusations. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, chapter 20, that the devil is known as the accuser of the brethren. The devil will accuse uh, every Christian to somebody else. Every brother, every sister, the devil will accuse you, and the only time he's not lying about you is when the truth is more damaging. That's the only time the devil will tell the truth is when the truth is the worst possible outcome that he could hope for. Just tell the truth. That's the only time. 
So the Lord yeah, God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. See, wrong answer. When the devil talks to you, all you got to say is, Get out of here. Right? I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Devil, I command you to depart from me in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us an exchange between Michael, the archangel, and the devil when they disputed about the body of Moses. And so Bible scholars believe the devil was trying to get the body of Moses after he died. Because the devil knew he could, make, he could get these people to make a shrine out of it and to worship this dead corpse of Moses because of how greatly God had used him. I mean, God used him more than practically everyone else in the Old Testament put together. I mean, it was he was just an, an, an amazing uh, figure in the history of Israel, especially. And, uh, and so God didn't want the devil to have the body of Moses. So there was Michael, the archangel, and there was the devil. And they were both wanted the same thing. They wanted the body of Moses. And uh, and and so what did Michael say? He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. That's what he said, right? He didn't go to Fifth City. He didn't say, man, my, my arms are bigger than your arms. You're about to get whooped, right? I'm about to put a hurt on you, Lucifer. He didn't say that. He said, the Lord rebuke me. So, the devil talks to you, don't answer him unless you're telling him to get away. Because, again, if you have a conversation with him, chances are you're going to end up on the losing end of that conversation. All right. We made it the fruit of the trees of the garden, or the trees of the fruit of the mystery. And the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. She just exposed her own ignorance when she said that. And that's why... Um, you know, you should make a point to not talk to someone that's very intelligent that wants to take advantage of you, you know, like salespeople, right? Some people don't, they, they don't like salespeople because they're afraid that salesperson is going to get them to spend their money on something and they don't have any money. They can't afford it. So they don't want to talk to them because they know that sales are going to get them. They're going to get that money, you know? Well, that's just like the devil. If you don't want him to get something of value that you have, then don't have that conversation. Because God did not say, don't touch it. And he didn't say, you might die if you eat it. He said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And what did the serpent say? You shall not surely die. Well, there, there came out the subtle creature very uh very nondescript maybe like a chameleon just kind of fitting into the surroundings not making a large production drawing attention to himself and what ended up happening it got to the point of a complete contradiction of what god had said that's why we have to be careful who we listen to right who we listen to some people are living a life of servitude to another person and that other person doesn't even love them, right? And if, if you go online, you'll find people that will take advantage of you, just like that, that crooked salesman, that used car salesman, right? They'll try to get you to become infatuated with them. They'll try to get you to uh, use your imagination and become infatuated with them. And, and, and uh, like, like there's a show called The 90 Day Fiance. I heard about it. <laughs> 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 this guy was trying to date this lady in a foreign country like Russia or Ukraine or something, Romania, whatever. And, uh, and she said that she needed money because uh, there's a hospital bill or something. So he, get, he gives her his credit card number, and then he shows up in Ukraine or Romania, wherever she was, and couldn't find out she used that credit card to buy her sister-in-law a car. See? So in that, in that 
in that realm of people, the, their, their idea of success is how bad they could take advantage of someone. And then they're going to show off to their friends, see, look what I got. This is, this is the spoils of war that I gathered through deception and by manipulation. Well, that's like uh, most people that are locked in prison, expert manipulators. No offense if you have people in prison. Don't worry about it. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, he said, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. So bad people are just a bad influence. So it doesn't matter how charming they, they uh, appear. It doesn't matter how good looking they are. It doesn't matter how intelligent they seem. It doesn't matter uh, how nice their, their fragrance they wear. When they start talking evil, when they start disputing what the Word of God says, when they start telling you, you don't need to go to that church, you, who's that preacher anyway? No man that has the right to tell you what to do. Well, it's a sacred obligation. There's a calling. It just went dark. There's a sacred obligation. Every person that is called of God, right? They, they have this duty unto God to speak on behalf of God, the word of God. And I know some people do it at, like a charlatan. They do it without any real... No, no reality of God behind it. But that's not everyone. Right? And God said in Jeremiah chapter 3, He said, I will give you pastors after mine own heart that will feed you with understanding and with knowledge. Let's see if I can find this for you. This is Jeremiah 3. 15, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So, be careful who you listen to. All right. Mark chapter 4, verses 22 through 25. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifest. Now, manifest means to be revealed, to be made known. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. So, this is just letting us know there's no secret that we have that God doesn't know about it. And if you've ever been in a Holy Ghost church service or Bible study or, or Bible uh, seminary class, then you know that God will reveal secret things, right? That you'd rather not talk about. You'd rather not hear about it. You'd rather not anyone know about it, but God knows. There's nothing hid. Everything is naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. The Bible tells us the night and the day are alike unto Him. God sees everything in the darkest night just as much as if it was the noonday sun. God knows us. God sees us. God knows the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. God knows the path that we're on, and He knows the desires we have that may or may not be with things that are pleasing unto God. God sees it all. God knows it all. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. So God wants us to hear Him. Right? When, when the world tells you, dance according to the world's drums, then God is saying, don't dance that way. Don't listen to it. Like, like Footloose. If you ever saw that movie. I think they, they had, there was the original back in the 80s, and then they did a remake uh, a few years back, I don't know, 10 years ago. And it's kind of funny if you think about it, because there was this town, and it was a dry town. Right? They didn't allow alcohol, and uh, there was uh, some type of preacher figure that was like really, you know, dominating the, the society of this little culture of this town. And there was to be no worldly music. And there was to be no worldly dancing. 
So these kids were going out of the town to go find some bar somewhere having, uh, like, I guess the original rave or something. You know, I mean, that that's pretty desperate, man. If you're, if you're dancing on a, in a barn floor, in the barn yard, you know. I mean, that's that's rough living right there. But if you have to go to a barn or a stable where there's animals for you to get your groove on or whatever type of simple pleasure you have, that's hard living right there. I'm just going to say that that's, that's hard living. Don't, don't try to tell me that you're in full control when you're going to some barn with animals to dance or something crazy like that. Anyway. So they were sneaking around because they weren't allowed to dance to that music in this town. And God, God wants us to dance with him. Amen. We, we can still keep dancing as Christians, but we just change partners. Right? We can still move around, but it's not as provocative, hopefully. You know? And if you're a dancing Christian, hopefully you don't hurt anything. You know, throw something out, out of place, you know. You don't want to hurt your epizootics, but you don't want to uh, you don't hurt your clavicle. Or your sac sacroiliacs, but <laughs> <laughs> protect your sacroiliac, whatever you do, okay? Don't hurt it, whatever that is. Okay, and he said unto them, this is Mark chapter 4 again, take heed what you hear. This is Jesus, the Lord, telling us, take heed what you hear. What he's saying there is pay attention or like a gentleman I know, this is my coffee break. Take a sec. Man, it really only tastes good when it's too hot to drink it. Once it cools off, it just doesn't taste as good. But anyway, this uh, this gentleman I know, his son was about three or four years old, and they were at the restaurant and. Uh, and his son kept making noise and throwing stuff or whatever. So he took him into the to the restroom to have a little conversation. And he's like, buddy, he said, I want you to listen to me. And I want you to listen close. And that little kid was standing there and he just leaned his head forward, you know. Because he said, listen close. And it was just too funny. I mean, that, that just that ruined the whole teaching moment for the father. I meant, listen carefully. Don't don't bring your head that close to me. You to listen, listen close. Take heed what you hear. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. Okay, so with what measure you meet. With how you dispense to others, that's how it shall be given back to you. And people wonder why they, they, they never have anything, because they never gave anything. So we have, we, we reap what we sow. If we don't sow anything, then we'll die of starvation. Right? You, can't, you can't be a farmer and not plant. So I just want it all to grow on its own, and I want it to harvest on its, on its own, and I want it to be stacked in bales in the backyard so that ready for transport. That's how I want to, that's not reality, right? Life is what? A do-it-yourself kit. There's assembly required. And we have to figure out the things that are most important in our lives so that we can apply ourselves unto wisdom. All right. And you and unto you that hear shall more be given. So if we pay attention to the words of Christ, to the word of God, we shall be benefited. And the more we pay attention to it, the more we will benefit from it. For he that hath to him shall be given, and to him that hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he hath. See, that's the complete opposite of communism, isn't it? That's the complete opposite of socialism. And people wonder why uh, they don't like political rhetoric to be shared in churches. 
right? Even though there's foundations of many beliefs and ideas that have become political ideas right here in the scripture. The Bible even says, if any man doth not work, neither should he eat. So if we don't work for it, then we don't have it. And if we're too lazy to get a job and to make money, to pay for the things of life that are important, then we'll be living in a cardboard box underneath an overpass somewhere. That's the facts of life, friends. There's no getting around it. So no, I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to have another baby. I'm going to get food stamps. I'm going to get welfare. It's just another form of slavery. Those people are addicted to that free money from the government. And what it does is it holds them back from pursuing any type of real ambition, any type of real desire to, to make something better of themselves, to live at a higher standard of living. They just settle. They settle for less. And friends, there's not enough food stamps in the world that can make up for what you lose by what receiving that government subsidy takes away from us. All right, Luke chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So, this is really taking heed to the word of God, not just allowing the sound to hit our ears, right? But to listen deeply, to ponder, to meditate. He said there in Psalm, but his delight, Psalm 1, uh, verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now that's meditate, not meditate. You can put your Bible under your pillow, take a nap, go to sleep all night. It's just going to give you a sore neck in the morning. It's not going to do anything. There, there's, there's none of this. There's no reading the Bible through osmosis. Right? That isn't going to get the job done, no. But he said, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Do we delight in the word of God? Or do we try to avoid it, put it out of our mind? Because it heaps condemnation upon what we want to do and the life that we're living. In his law doth he meditate day and night to think about it. What does the Bible say? What does it really mean? And can we get it down inside our heart? He said there in Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God to ingest it, to get the word of God inside of us. Just like that food, right? You are what you eat. So if we don't eat the word of God, we cannot have the word of God manifest through our lives. Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. The Bible tells us to taste and see that the Lord is good. And God is his word. The word of God is God. And the more that we can understand it, the more we can get it inside of ourselves, just like food. To eat it, to let it get inside our heart, to get it inside our minds, to where uh, when you face a situation, the word of God can speak to your heart about what's going on to help you to make the proper Christian decision. In that, in that situation. And there's another 
uh, scripture in the book of Ezekiel, similar to this one from Revelation, where God tells the prophet to eat the roll. He said, eat the roll. And notice how it was in his mouth sweet. There's something about, something about the word of God that's sweet. Right? When, when you love God, when you know God loves you, it's just so sweet. And, and, uh, and I know for preachers, they love the Word of God because it just, it does something for them. If you ever talk to a preacher about something they're excited about, then you know what I'm talking about here. And uh, uh, Pastor Davis used to say, He'd say things like, if, if you, you know, brother, if you got as excited about Jesus as you do about that girl, you might get somebody saved. If you got as excited about Jesus as those other things in the world that you get so excited about, you might get somebody saved. Well, hopefully, we're excited about Jesus today. Hopefully, we're excited about the Word of God. Hopefully, we get excited when we hear the Word of God. But why would it be bitter in the prophet's belly? It gets bitter because sometimes the word of God is against someone's sin. And it could involve some type of judgment that God's going to bring. And God brings warning. God will bring warning to people. He said there in the book of Revelation, that he gave this woman Jezebel a space of repentance, but she repented not. This is in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. So, so this is the Lord Jesus talking to the Apostle John to send this message to, Th to the pastor of Thyatira. And this is part of what he was saying. So this is an example of the Word of God coming in to, to, the, to the minister. And yes, it's sweet in their mouth when, when they partake of it. It doesn't hit that preacher necessarily uh, because they're not guilty of the sin that God wants to have that sin addressed in a service or whatever. But the knowledge that judgment is coming, that's what makes it bitter to the belly. Knowing that there's people that are going to die lost no matter what we do. And that's the hardest thing with being a preacher is when you run into people that you just can't help. Them. And the only people that God can't help are the people that don't listen. If we will listen to God, if we will listen to the voice of God, if we will listen to the people of God, if we will listen to our pastor, if we will be conscientious about how we live our life and not drink Pepsi with the devil, we can make it to heaven. And if we don't, we won't. God is not going to drag anyone through the pearl gate into his presence. There's no dragging going on. There's no kidnapping going on. There's no hostages going to heaven going on. You can still just wake up. It'll wake up when you do it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. No hostages being dragged to heaven, only willing participants, only those who love his appearing. I said that in Thessalonians. Oh, somebody just left. Oh, someone just came back. Thessalonians This is in Second Thessalonians chapter two. 
verses 9 and 10. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. This is dealing with the tribulation and the Antichrist. With all power and signs and lying wonders. That's going to be the false prophet. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Because why? Because they received not the love of the truth. That they might be saved. We have to love the truth of God's word. We have to love Jesus. We have to love being corrected by God. Knowing that God is real in our lives. And knowing that God has a plan. And, and, and he has a purpose for our lives. That he wants us to follow. And when we start going off the road. What if you're driving with somebody. And they start driving off the road. You do. You say watch out. You're going to kill us. You see that semi over here? What's wrong with you? Well, that's how God is when he rides alongside us in our lives. He's trying to warn us. He's trying to shape us. He's trying to help us to survive through this sinful world so that we can be with him throughout all eternity. There's nothing in this world that's worth holding on to. It's like a drowning man holding on to his gold. And you can't tread water holding all that extra weight. That gold is heavy. It's like lead. It will cause you to sink. And then there you are drowning. And so it is with people that want to hold on to sin. It's just like that drowning man holding on to his bags of gold. So, well, for right now, as long as I hold on to it, I'm rich. Yes, but you're going to die. But I feel so good having this, these possessions. I feel so good enjoying these sinful pleasures. Yes, but it's going to lead to death. Just distracting. Nope, everybody out there thinks I'm crazy. I keep walking over there. Yeah, technical. We got some technical issues. Don't worry about it. All right. Just never mind. <laughs> but there's nothing in this world we can hold on to that's going to last except for Jesus Christ, except for the Word of God, except for the Holy Ghost. These are the things that we have to hold on to that we can take with us from this life into the next life. And lastly here, I'd just like to share an example, illustration about a classical violinist named Joshua Bell. And Joshua Bell is one of the best concert violinists in the world. And he played a, he played a free concert for 45 minutes on a violin worth $3.5 million at a subway station in Washington, D.C. This was several years ago. Over a thousand people passed. Only seven stopped to listen to him play, including a three-year-old boy, and only one person recognized him out of a thousand. And I want you to know Jesus is just like this man. Joshua Bell. He's just like that. He is playing the sweetest song. He is calling to everyone that passes by. And everyone is busy going about the affairs of their life. And they don't take the time to listen. This was the greatest, one of the greatest violinists. Playing one of the most expensive violins. And he was playing one of the most complicated violin uh, music, uh, musical I can't remember what they're called. Composition. The composition. That they, they call them different things. Like the, uh, the symphony and, and different things. But it was, made, it was by Bach. And everybody just kept passing him by. Only seven people stopped out of a thousand. And only one person recognized who he really was. Out of a thousand. And just because the world is on its way to hell, and just because, the, the, uh, for the most part, people can't be bothered with this one 
called Jesus Christ. Just because everybody thinks that going to church may be a waste of time and giving money and tithe and offering is a waste of money. That doesn't mean that they're right. And that doesn't mean that we're wrong. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. And he plays that song, that sweet song, and people want to do something else. They don't want to listen. God calls and calls and calls to people. But they're too busy. God deals with people. and God draws us to repentance. And God convicts us of our sin. But we dismiss it like we're always going to have another opportunity, another chance. When there's nothing that can be further from the truth. One day... We will breathe our last breath. Our heart will beat one last time. And we will step out of this world into eternity. And at that moment, it's only going to matter. Did you love Jesus with all your heart? Did you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? Did you give up all the things of sin and of the world that were displeasing unto God because you wanted to please the one? who has called you to be his child, to be his servant, to be his co-laborer. That's all we have time for tonight. God bless you. We hope to see you Sunday in service, uh, either here in Fresno or online. And... Hopefully uh, some of you will watch this after the fact because we, we're definitely missing a large, uh, large part of the congregation today. But God loves you. No matter when you see this, God loves you. God cares. God wants to bless you. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Good night, sir. Good night.